Good evening, everyone. Bienvenidos. Good evening. Good evening. Evening, good. <laughs> and welcome, Maria. Good evening from the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, and welcome to tonight's event. I'm Maria Barney, and I'm from the Hispanic Society's Education Department. I'd like to thank everyone first for tuning in to hear about the talented and thoughtful artists who created the installation of mural paintings mm -hmm. currently on exhibition at the museum's Audubon Terrace. And I'd also like to welcome tonight's moderator, Miria Leva Gutierrez, Executive Director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, also known as NOMA who will be presenting on the history of mural making, followed by a conversation with the artists about their work. Carla Torres is a visual artist working across several media, including drawing, painting, illustration, animation, and murals. Originally from Ecuador, she relocated to New York City in 2006. And since then, her work has been exhibited in several galleries locally and internationally, including the Queens Museum and the Noguchi Museum. Vister Rondon is a professional dance choreographer, visual artist, and founder of the internationally known I Love My Hood movement. A New York City native, his home led him to b-boying and hip hop, to salsa and mambo, and even to aerosol art on the walls, leading him to become one of the most well-known dancers and overall artists in New York City. Carlos Jesus Martinez Dominguez, also known as Figs, Figaro, and Fyro 173, is a Caribbean New Yorker living in Washington Heights since 1984, who has exhibited, taught, spoken, curated, and learned in at numerous institutions nationally and internationally. In Carlos's words, quote, my work conveys my anxiety and thrill regarding history, how that history manifests in the present and presents implications for the future, end quote. Dani Peguero is a Dominican-American multidisciplinary artist and designer from Washington Heights. He came up in the 80s and 90s, heavily influenced by his neighborhood, music, fashion, and the genuine leaders from his community. His passion for art and design led him into a career in apparel and footwear design. He now manages a design service business that caters to the small businesses in Uptown and beyond. He specializes in graphic design, brand development, and large scale mural objects. And finally, our moderator, Nidia Leva Gutierrez. Nidia Leva Gutierrez earned her BA in art history and Spanish literature from Tufts University and a PhD in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. She's a published scholar in the field of Spanish and Latin American art has served as a curator and museum advisor around the country and as an art history professor for 20 years before joining NOMA in 2020, where she currently serves as executive director. Thank you again for joining us. So Nidia, when you're ready, please, please feel ready to begin. Thank you so much, Maria. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Here we go. Um, thank you so much, um, Maria and Cristina, uh, to our wonderful partners and neighbors at the Hispanic Society. It's really been a joy working together. I'm incredibly excited to be here tonight with these four fantastic artists who will talk about the works they created in October of 2020 and which are now located on the Audubon Terrace at the Hispanic Society. These murals tell a story about immigration about a diverse Latinx population from the Caribbean, Central and South America, making its way to New York City, specifically to Upper Manhattan, beginning at the end of the 19th century and continuing today. These works were commissioned by HBO on the occasion of their release of Siempre Luis, a documentary on Luis A. Miranda, Puerto Rican longtime political consultant, activist, Washington Heights resident, and general force of nature. A champion of the arts, Miranda asked HBO to work with us at NOMA to enlist local artists to create a mural documenting and highlighting the contributions of the Latinx community to Upper Manhattan over time. 
And we will have a chance to talk more about this in a bit. Um, but to be sure, uh, I wanted to make the point that these murals are part of a larger tradition of painting on walls that extends back to the Paleolithic period. Indeed, the act of painting on walls, whether with fresco, encaustic, oil, tempera, or spray paint, has been around as long as humans have sought ways to proclaim their very existence, or later to record their cultures, behaviors, rituals, and politics. Beginning with rock paintings found in Namibia from around 26,000 years ago, or Aboriginal rock art in Australia, or in Europe with the early cave paintings in France or Spain, the human impulse has always been strongly in favor of observing and documenting the world around us. For the Egyptians, that meant painting the walls of their ancient mastabas or tombs, relating the life and practices of the deceased, activities they would continue in the afterlife. For the Romans, mural painting proliferated on the walls and ceilings of almost all of its buildings, public and private, landscapes, still life, life-size figured, and architectural elements, using illusion and multiple vanishing points. The four styles of wall painting in Rome spanned over 200 years for three Oops, sorry, I, was on, I thought I was on mute. Okay. <laughs> for the Mayans of the 8th century at Bonham Park, it meant creating a program for three richly painted rooms that heralded the birth of a young ruler and established and celebrated the royal family's lineage. In the late Middle Ages, wall painting had a long history in both religious and secular architecture. We might think of the great Giotto or Lorenzetti, the former created frescoes for the chapel, and the latter here, monumental illusionistic frescoes allegorizing government for the Palazzo Pubblico or Sienese City Hall. The Renaissance, of course, proved to be a golden age for wall painting. And of course, I'm thinking here about Masaccio, perhaps Michelangelo's magnificent frescoes for the Sistine Chapel and Raphael's series of frescoes for the papal apartments, just to name a few. And I did want to take a minute to point out here that the Bonham Park murals that we just saw from the 8th century predate Michelangelo's Sistine masterpiece by several hundred years. The Baroque continued and exploded the idea of wall painting, extending it to some of the most extraordinary ceiling paintings in history. We might consider Anibale Caracci's Palazzo Farnese in Rome, Pietro de Cortona's Barberini Palace ceiling, and of course, the great Peter Paul Rubens, whose tapestry designs for the Descalces Convent in Madrid inspired new Spanish artists to decorate chapels and sacristies in Mexico, for example, at the direction of local bishops. And I'm showing you here works by Baltasar de Chávez Rioja and Cristóbal de Villalpando. But perhaps there is no greater moment for the history and legacy of mural painting than the Mexican mural movement of the early 20th century. Emerging around 1920 after the end of the Mexican Revolution, the monumental public murals commissioned by the newly installed government of President Obregón under the aegis of the Minister of Culture, José Vasconcelos, depicted the history and everyday life of modern Me Mexicans in a way that never had been seen before. The social potential for mural painting was extraordinary. Through visual language on a grand stage, artists could inform and educate the population in public spaces around the country and later the hemisphere through their messages of politics, identity, oppression, progress, health, technology, resistance, and cultural ancestry. The Tres Grandes, as they were called, Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Siqueiros, revolutionized painting and through the linking of art and politics against the backdrop of the accessibility of messaging, cultivated a lasting legacy that appears in the United States later, just after the Great Depression, through the work of WP artists, WPA artists like Charles White, Aaron Douglas, Jacob Lawrence, and Thomas Hart Benton, just to name a few. Indeed, post offices, hospitals, libraries, and schools all across this nation are filled with murals creating narratives with varying success about the American experience. 
And the mural paintings and graffiti that are big and small cities boast like San Francisco, Philadelphia, Chicago, Newark, and New York, of course, to name just a few, are testaments to the power of public art and the impulse of the human to paint on walls, to cover surfaces that speak to the masses, that challenge, that instigate, that memorialize, and that document our collective experience. And of course, we saw that most recently last summer after the murder of George Floyd, the many murals that appeared all over the country and all over the world on boarded up storefronts and other walls, artists working while the world had shut down. This is less a history since to speak of the history of mural making would require more than an hour to say the least. And instead, it serves more as an introduction to tonight's program, which brings together these four muralists who, through their own work, occupy an important place in the history of wall painting. It is now my pleasure to introduce each artist in chronological order who will first tell us a bit about their mural and how they came to interpret the period they were assigned. And I'll begin tonight with Carlos Martinez, whose mural is The Early Diaspora, 1898 to 1940s. Carlos, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that, Neria. Um, I really appreciate that. It's, it's also a little uh, intimidating being put into the same breath as all that history. Um, I, uh, first off, don't really see myself as a, a muralist per se, right? Um, you know, uh, this is really a, a piece that I kind of um, envisioned as a smaller piece, right? I kind of attacked it the way I would a piece of canvas or a mixed media piece that I might make on my coffee table at home, um, just a lot bigger. Um, I would, I was, uh, I was given the 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 first time period, um, which was the early diaspora, but I kind of. Um, stretch it a little bit uh, before um, the time period that I'm given going all the way back to kind of the precursor um, to like immigration into New York City with Juan Rodriguez in 1613. So he kind of like, you know, is like this big shadow over everything else that's in the mural per se. Um, but um, the I was really happy to end up with the 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 subject matter. It's um it's something that I I I teach and I make art about on a normal basis anyway, which is kind of the early diaspora, a diaspora that's still here today. Um, when we're talking about the time period and the location in New York that we're talking about, mostly thinking about Washington Heights and uptown in general. Um, I really thought about this Caribbean Spanish speaking diaspora from Cuba, the Dominican Republic and uh, Puerto Rico, not in, not in chronological order. Um, so, you know, I first started thinking about like shapes of the places these people were coming from, right? Like the idea of borders, both uh, man-made and, uh, you know, natural. So, um, and also work that I do with a collaborator by the name of Pepe Coronado um, that uses a lot of these outlines of different islands, um, primarily the Dominican Republic and the United States. Um, so I'm kind of using, uh, you know, pretty much just shapes and colors in the piece along with um, typography, hand style. Um, you know, my favorite uh, muralist time period would be graffiti. And I did participate um, in the graffiti movement for a certain time period. But even then I wasn't a muralist. I was a tagger, a writer, right? Somebody that would write their name on the wall over and over again, as opposed to somebody that would paint a masterpiece on the wall. And both of them belong um, in the art form, but that's the one that I, um, practice, which was a tagger. So I kind of just um, am littering uh, different points in history, different places um, that these, uh, that these, uh, this diaspora comes from. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy to come up with it. I'm using different materials like spray paint, marker, um, string, screws, right? And I'm trying to evoke this idea of movement 
right? Like this movement of, you know, migratory movement within the nation, but also immigrate, you know, immigrant movement um, from outside of the nation. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'll, I'll, I'd love to talk about it more a little later on, but that's um, overall what it was about. That's great. Thank you. We look forward to hearing more. Um, I wanted to uh, next introduce our mural, um, the second in the, in the chronology, the diaspora and community building that traces the period from the 1960s and 1970s. And so uh, to do that, I'd like to introduce um, Dister, who will tell us a little bit about um, this commission that he received and um, how he interpreted um, the historical period. Yes, sir. I think you're on mute. I am, hello everybody. Uh, well, uh, similar to what Carlos said, uh, I appreciate you guys having me uh, put into that significant bracket. I don't know if I deserve to be there, but either way, we're here. Um, for this specific piece, after doing not so much research. And what I, what I mean by that is because it, there's just so much information out there. By the way, this, is, this picture that we have up is of, is of uh, the not finished, unfinished piece. So there are certain elements there that are, aren't really in detail, but uh, um, it's, it's pretty, it, it's something that um, kind of is a bit mind boggling to me because we have so much history and information and uh, past events and even current events that are happening that are so blatantly oppressive and, and uh, heavy handed by, by the US, you know, by the hand of the US that it, it's still, you know, it, uh, I'm still confused as to why we're still in this position that we're in right now. Um, but for this piece being that Joanna, this, uh, Joanna, uh, I'm sorry, her last name was um, Miss. The, the way, she's a, I'm sorry? Yeah, from Baruch uh, College, she's a professor, Joanna Fernandez. The historian Joanna Fernandez, I'm sorry. Um, she described it as the tentacles of the US and that kind of just struck a bell in my head and it was just really easy for me to be able to depict you know, the uh, United States in that way. And uh, pretty fun for me. Uh, and at the same time, it's something that I don't consider it as so much in the, in the past, uh, because again, this is something that is continuing and we're still going through. So these elements are, were so, uh, were not really hard for me to be able to, to convey. You know, I know sometimes in different projects and you know, depending on what the, the different period you might get or, or wh whatever the context might be, uh, an artist might have a difficult time depicting that. And I generally did not simply because it's, it, was, it was an era of so much. Um, it, it was, uh, it's an era of, of, of a lot, I guess, to, to put it so simply. Um, and I wish I could have added more, but um, I'm really happy that uh, HBO, Noma, and everybody involved were really hands off and allowing us to just create, which doesn't really exist often. I'm sure the other artists can attest to that. There's always a bit of, well, can we change this a bit or can we change that? So, um, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the, the particulars of the commission, um, because um, I know that that was such an abbreviated um, sort of period of time where you had to sort of work. So I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about the process um, when we when we finish the introductions. Um, thank you, Mr. I appreciate uh, that. Um, I wanted next to introduce Danny Peguero, uh, whose mural Latinx Identity, the Voices of the Diaspora is on the screen. Uh, that's the period between the 1980s and 1990s. Danny, are you ready? I think you're muted. There you go. Gotcha. Hey guys, uh, thank you for the opportunity, first and foremost. Um, so I was tasked with the 
capturing visually the period from 1977 to uh, the mid 90s. Um, and initially I struggled with composition because it was such a heavy, heavy time period with all these different events, uh, similar to what Dister mentioned. Um, so I kind of had to be strategic in what I included and what I excluded. Um, so I made it difficult, uh, but I, I, I persevered through, I think. Um, Joanna was a huge help in kind of uh, extracting what was, uh, what was major, what was um, significant. Um, and also what I also struggled with is uh, a particular site guys varies from one individual to the other. So I uh, wanted to um, kind of get, get the gist of the time. So I asked, I asked my parents uh, to give me a sense of like uh, the times back then. I had older friends who, uh, who um, I consulted with. <clears throat> So I decided to touch uh, to approach it on a collage uh, attack because I didn't want to include so many elements without it somehow making sense. So I think uh, collage form allowed me to do that. Um, so we first start with the Statue of Liberty. Uh, I depicted her as a Latina. Um, I think that was the anchor imagery I wanted to uh, make prominent. And you have certain like accessories on her that uh, were telling of the times, the bamboo earring, the, the nose ring, um, the, her hairstyle, the curly hair dripping over her, um, her forehead. I think that was a, a popular look back then. And I wanted to really push that forward. Um, she's visually fired up and she, her, her posture is one of someone who's dejected, angry, frustrated. She has her hand, her, her left hand up, fist up, and the uh, other hand is holding the bullhorn. And what she's expressing is the frustrations, the gripes, and um, pleading with government to um, hear her neglected people. And she's symbolic in that she serves as a conduit uh, between the people and government. So I thought that was something that <clears throat> that the time reflected that there was a, a it was a, a period where we finally a, what's the term for it um, where we approached government in a way that. We were able to articulate our, our concerns. So that's what I tried to depict there. Um, you have on the other side, the individuals playing dominoes down there. Um, the Immigration Reform Act came in 1986, signed by Ronald Reagan. And that was a pivotal time. Um, that essentially effectively made it so that anyone who was in this country illegally um, would now have legal status so the, the mood that I tried to depict there was um, jovial, fun, uh, celebratory, um, almost as if they just got news about the amnesty I passed through. Uh, so a huge sense of relief, I know, that came to the people back then. Um, so yeah, those are two major points that I tried to push with uh, my mural here. Hope I achieved that. Thank you, Danny. That's excellent. Um, great. Okay, I want to move on to the the final uh, mural uh, by Carla Torres Torres, who uh, was interpreting the new diaspora. Um, and uh, Carla, tell us a little bit about um, your interpretation, your mural, and your ideas behind this. You're muted. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Nia. Um, yeah, the period of time that I was assigned was uh, the um, um, new immigrants and uh, how uh, Hurricane Maria pushed a uh, new immigration from Puerto Rico. Um, I was given, uh, since you asked about the, the process of, of, the, of the creation and the, 
our relation with the agency. I received, I received uh, a brief and with some stating points of what was important in my mural. And, and among those, those streamlines, let's say there was the, um, the word vote. Uh, also because this panel um, was connected um, um, with, um, with the elect electoral campaign that it was the presidential elections uh, around that time. Um, uh, so uh, they wanted also to use the, this panel to invite people to, to exercise the, the right to vote. So I, I took that and, and I give it a, a, little, a little swift and add the word we vote because um, to emphasize in two things. Um, one, the, um, the thing that if um, Puerto Ricans cannot vote for, pre uh, for president if they don't live in the mainland. Uh, so that to me is like they are being treated as a, almost as a second class citizen because they are affected by the by the federal but they can note they have no voice there so but my panel was about like the new immigration coming uh, so um my image was focused on that they are here now and they can vote and emphasizing also the voting as a sort of power um, and there's this group of people here that I was conflicted. How do I uh, say they are from, from Puerto Rico? Uh, I didn't want to use uh, the flag, the complete flag, uh, but I um, use an element of the Puerto Rican flag, the, the blue star, and, and put it like in the front, in the, in the forehead of the, main, of the main character there to emphasize that they are coming from Puerto Rico. In the background, I depicted um, a sort of portrait, hidden portrait of, of, Luis, of young Luis Miranda. Um, to, um, so he is, he is there in the background uh, and he is uh, there to represent um, be, uh, him and people of his generation and previous generations that have been fighting for the right of Latinos in the, in the, in the US. Um, the, the light coming out of, 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 their, of his head represents the brilliance of ideas that all these people had. And, uh, and the sweat and the tears represent the effort and struggles they had to face in order um, to, to build what they have built for us uh, to enjoy now. Um, and the eyes and, uh, and, sil and silhouettes uh, behind represent, represents new and new and new generations that will come and they will vote. So be aware that they are watching and they are voting. <laughs> so that was more or less my, my take on it. And uh, also my panel um, in the documentary film, um, um, Luis Miranda talks about um, how they, in, in his fight, uh, he had American allies. So the blue stars represent the American allies and the golden stars represent what, uh, uh, what I consider Latino people to be a golden star. So that was my take on it. And, I represent the, the um, Uracan in a very graphic way for trying to create this movement that pushed everybody, everybody out of, of, out of Puerto Rico. And interesting enough, while, I while we were painting in the facility, we made friends with a young guy that was working in this facility. So he, he came, he approached us, he here as speaking Spanish and he approached to us to, to be friends. So we were telling him what was the mural about, et cetera, et cetera. And interesting, <laughs> he, he told us like he was one of these new people coming from Puerto Rico that after Hurricane Maria, he had to leave the island and he came to the US and found, found a job there in the facility there that we were working. So it was like an interesting note that we were representing something that is so real. 
That's fascinating. Thank you. I wanted to tell and this is sort of for all of you to sort of think about, I want to talk a little bit about the the process, sort of from the beginning, from the commission. Um, I think it was something like a four week process. It might've been less. Um, take me or take us through what that looked like, sort of learning um, that you would be working on this, sort of having to do the research, being assigned your topic, um, and then having to work in a facility, you know, in the throes of, of sort of COVID, right? We were sort of on the verge there of um, our second significant lockdown. Um, and so th it was quite a feat to actually uh, to be able to produce these works. So, so take us through a little bit about, um, take us through what that looked like. Any one of you um, can, can go ahead and, and, and take that or start. Well, I thought, it, I thought it was very well managed by the agency. It was very professional. Um, they, it was a short time period. Um, to, so we had to work 24 seven <laughs> to, to be able to meet the deadline. Um, but it was a, a very well guided and facilitated by the, uh, the creative directors and the project manager. I believe now they're in the facility and um, I know like um, uh, Dister, Danny and Carlos had some problems and had to be relocated. So, and that was a significant, um, um, I don't know, <laughs> um, challenge for, for them. You can talk more about that. <laughs> yes, yeah, they, um, they, <laughs> Yeah. Can you believe that uh, they just didn't get the memo <laughs> that we uh, we use spray cans? <laughs> I don't know how that how got how that got lost in translation, but um, yeah. uh, we had to we had to be moved essentially to like the basement facility <laughs> storage area, um, <laughs> and you know that that wasn't conducive to to getting the project done effectively or um, in a timely manner. So yeah. we, um, we definitely struggled with uh, just the switch of the location, but we knew what, um, we knew how much time we had and, and, and what we had to do to, to, uh, to achieve it. I actually took work home with me. Um, yeah. There's some panels on that wall that are not actually attached to the wall, meaning that um, I put it, I, I essentially made them at, at home and then attached it onto the wall just because I wouldn't have had time to, do it all at the facility because they they shut down at five o'clock. So you can imagine so, being yeah, in the zone. Let me let me ask about that, Danny. That uh <laughs> that uh that one with the uh, uh with the coffee cup in her hand with and the, the rollers, right? right? With the rollers. Yeah. That must have taken you a lot of time. There was because the size. Yeah, there was a lot of detail on that. Um, you know what's another thing that came into play? Uh, you guys heard about this his dance career. Um, he kept trying to dance battle me all throughout the day. And, you know, I told him, listen, we got to get this done. Let's, let's, let's get back to painting. But yeah, that was my experience. Right. Right. Uh, but you know, what the crazy thing is that this happened, like right now it's, you know, kind of in hindsight, but when this, when we were painting it, this was when we really didn't know what COVID really was. Like it was still in the mix of, we don't know what's happening like you know it was still there was the, 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 like a vaccine wasn't even in sight at that time so it was definitely interesting and yeah but even buying materials being buying uh supplies was tough yeah so you bought so you did you um so you gave them a list of your materials and so even before the project started you had to be relocated or had you already started and then you needed to be relocated uh, we, well, we never started. We never started. Right. We, lo we lost. We lost a good maybe six. No, I lost a full day because of that. A full yeah. day, which is like, and 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 in a mural making process, a full day is like that could get you maybe eight feet across a, across a mural. So I lost a full day because of it. Um, I, I that's that's why I ended up taking the work home, just because I wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise. Carlos, did you run into the same issue as well? Um, yes, I did using a lot of spray paint. Um, I lost a day uh, 
I scheduled the first two days of work with um, with an assistant, uh, Palen Obesa, helped me out for about four hours when she was supposed to be around for full two full days of work on the mural. Um, so yeah, it was a big problem. And uh, we, uh, I don't know, you know, in a way it was really nice. I never, you know, uh, uh, been commissioned to do a piece of art in such a big warehouse in a different location and stuff. It seemed nice at first, um, <laughs> but then being there, it was almost like it was an afterthought. Um, and I think it's pretty narrow minded, um, you know, thinking about art, thinking about mural making and not thinking about spray paint is kind of like really kind of asinine. Um, so yeah, uh, I know process wise, I flipped the switch and just kind of went, you know, the direction of mixed media and kind of throwing down paint and, you know, throwing up a tag. If I didn't like it, throwing a stencil over that tag. So my process is very, you know, loosey goosey, so to speak. I know Dister and um, Danny are very, you know, methodical, you know what I mean? Like they're very detailed orientated. So I really felt for them because they lost a lot of time um, with that, with that snafu. I said, uh, loosey goosey and snafu. <laughs> a third, third one for a trilogy. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, how long, I mean, how long, how long, you need for this sort of in your mind going you know into this and how long did you actually have to do it I could have done it in a couple of hours or I could have done it in seven days I mean literally I finished mine in a probably about less than 10 hours of work probably about eight hours of work actually yeah. I like because my process is hanging out I was I was hanging out I take a break I go smoke a cigarette <laughs> I make a call, I go work a little bit again, you know? That's what I'm saying. I have a different process, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just how about you? My process, well, um, to be honest, I, I'm still, I still consider myself to be learning even how, what my own process is because um, it, it's, you know, I've been in situations where a mural could have taken me three hours and it took me three days because mm -hmm. either I didn't prepare properly or I just try to freestyle it, which sometimes it's, it's worked, but you lose, you know, at the end of the day, I have to consider this, you know, it's as a, you need to finish this, let's do it. And, you know, it can be loosey goosey. So I'm still in the process of trying to um, change or, or find my own, my own method, which, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm enjoying it, but it's still, um, it's still a funky. That's another one for you. Funky. Okay, so we're going to see who else can use Lucy Goosey uh, in, uh, mm -hmm. in their conversation. Um, you, you said, though, that this was a mostly sort of a hands-off process, that you sort of were left um, to, to interpret um, the themes as, as you, you know, as, as you wanted to. Um, did you, did you, prepare sketches for them? Did you talk mm -hmm. about what you were gonna do? Um, yeah. Was there a lot of back and forth or, or what did that look like? There was a sketch. Um, there were only like very small things that, that were suggested I change. I think, it, I can't remember exactly what it was, um, but there were only a few elements. Um, I was very adamant about making sure that the pigs stayed there, uh, representing the police department, but um, even now, like, I'm like, the police don't deserve to be called pigs. Like, even that term is like, uh, they don't deserve it. But that's another conversation. Um, but th there was a sketch, but there wasn't really much more. There wasn't much of a pushback, which I found it surprising on my end. Because there's never been a time when they're like, yeah, great, go for it. Was it experience? Did you feel the same kind of, you know, uh, freedom to... To create in the way you wanted to or to interpret it in the way you wanted to? Danny, how about you? Uh, I didn't know that was directed to me. Um, yeah. I, you know, the concept of the Latina Statue of Liberty, I, I've been wanting to paint that so long. 
And <laughs> when I got an opportunity to, to get paid to paint it, you know, on a large scale, and once it got approved, I was ecstatic. I loved it. Um, it's actually one of my homegirls. I didn't let HBO know about this uh, mm. because they probably would have wanted all types of waivers signed. And that would have just uh, threw a monkey wrench in the process. But yeah, um, I asked one of my homegirls, hey, bro, I need a favor. I need a model to pose in this particular way, making this particular facial gesture. And she got it to me the same day and I got right to it. Um, but there, there wasn't any, I, I, you gotta give credit to, uh, to Lewis because I know that that was something he was adamant about, um, letting the artist cook, you know? And I, if, I don't think if it was, for, if he didn't mention that or somehow like uh, conveyed that to the HBO team, um, there probably would have been a lot more scrutiny on the art and would have got uh, a lot of stuff would probably got turned down. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I mean, I think one of the things that Luis in, in, in speaking to us at NOMA, I mean, as you said, was adamant about was really, um, you know, turning the project over to to artists from Upper Manhattan. Um, and um, you know, it was something that that uh, he was very clear about from the very beginning. Um, and, and that's why he, he worked you know, with us at NOMA, um, so that that we could we could uh, help facilitate that. Um, I, I was I was going to ask also one of the things I thought was really interesting. You know, sort of kind of received, received this time period. I know that Carlos and Carla um, were very happy um, with uh, their time periods and actually um, were thrilled that they didn't have each other's time period. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> you said that you, you were so grateful you didn't have to do the first one. Yes, because we we had a meeting where, and, and this was strategically done by the creative directors. They were they knew what they were doing and who they were assigning what. <laughs> and they told us, like, they are assigning us, uh, assigning us the, their um, periods of the movie according to our styles and um, the period that they think we can thrive the most. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when uh, um, they said that in the meeting and they were describing period by period. So they started with Carlos Neuron describing what it is about. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I hope, I hope that, that, is, that is not my mural. <laughs> I hope that is not my mural because it was such a um, complex and uh, that I was like, oh, I wish that is not mine because it's gonna be a struggle to convey or uh, that much information in, in one image. Um, so, and then uh, they started describing the others and I, I felt happy either with mine or, where, or with Danny's. Danny's. Danny's theme I also like. <laughs> I can, oh, I can do that one or the one that I was assigned. Those were my best. Um, choices. <laughs> right. And then Carlos, you, you said that um, you were thrilled that you didn't have Carlos and that you really were very happy with um, your your time period. Um, share a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I ended up with the time period that I wanted the most and it would have went in chronological order with Carla's mm -hmm. being last, um, least, least wanted. Um, you know, in my own work, um, I concentrate on on the histories that 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 were assigned to me. I mean, and and all of all of these time periods, um, what people call the Latinx diaspora is something that I work in every day, talking about um, as an educator at the places that I work at. Um, you know, if I could back it up for a moment, I'm here nonchalantly being like, yeah, I just put some paint on the wall and I'm done. No, that's not necessarily how my art is. The thing is, um, the prep for this is mostly historically based. There's arguments built in there. And, you know, it's something I talk about it on a daily basis. So it's like the work was already done in a way. And I kind of need to juggle my memory um, on different, you know, phrases or places and time, you know, uh, different years that things happen. And yeah, I got to speak to Joanna Fernandez, which I've had the, you know, the, the luxury of talking to and listening to before. I also reached out to Robert Snyder, the Manhattan historian, 
uh, Jensen Ortiz um, from the Dominican Studies Institute. I was trying to look for specific information that I might not be aware of um, pertaining to Washington Heights in particular with the early diaspora. Um, and, you know, I really, really like these hidden gems, right? Like 10 years ago, Juan Rodriguez was a hidden gem. And to the rest of the country, probably still is a hidden gem, right? But um, these are, you know, or a Carlos Cooks, you know, where most people don't know how monumental this dude was, but Malcolm X thought so, you know what I mean? Like, and I like those histories that are harder to find because we're not teaching them. Um, right now, without going into a deep discussion, I, I don't know what this Latin X, as it's called, diaspora really is. You know what I mean? Like I'm hearkening back to a simpler time that I'm calling a Caribbean diaspora, you know, which already had its complexities and its diversity within it also. But it just seemed really, really monumental to talk about something that that people are calling a Latinx diaspora. I still don't know what that is. And I normally, I'm critical to people's interpretation right. of what right. it is. I, 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 I definitely understand uh, Carlos's point. I personally, I, I do understand what it is. I don't agree with it, what it is. Um, but at the same time, I respect the transition and the process that we're in right now. Um, and in reality, Carlos, Carlos a few years ago said something that has always stuck in my head. He said, it's unfortunate that people from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic and Cuba, for example, have more in common with Africa, yet we call our uh, friends and neighbors in you know, Mexico and Latin America and South America, our primos, and you know, we have this this uh you know i guess banter or just relationship we have but we we shun our our african you know roots uh not everyone but you know and it's you know and so that it, in my head comes around full circle when that word latin comes around or, uh, and then he you mentioned also regarding uh spanish imposed was it what was that term you said um, yeah, I, I, you know, I want to, you know, it's a silly term, but it's also very accurate, right? A Spanish imposed diaspora, right. or just simply a Spanish speaking diaspora, because it's accurate. It's not implying all the other things that Latinx. Oh, I'm sorry, we're changing the subject of this whole talk, aren't we? Yeah, right. um, <laughs> but, but. but but that was very and thank you for that dister because that was very much kind of like the questions that I'm asking. You know what I mean? Like in the mural by by throwing out these other phrases in it um, that people might have used in that time period. You know what I mean? Like mm. they might, you know, my abuelita would be like, Latin, what? You know, so it's kind of the also paying homage to those time periods and those terms or interpretations of those terms. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think I think one of the things that um, is so interesting, and I think that you've all done it, you know, in a, in a different way or in your own way, um, is really to um, comment um, or to bring to light sort of the complexity, right, um, of, 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 of the entire experience, right, the entire, um, you know, cultural uh, immigrant experience, political experience. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's one of the reasons why when we look at these works, um, they, they are so powerful because, you know, this or you sort of mentioned that we're in this sort of transitional period. I mean, it seems like we've been in the transitional period for, for such a long time. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and yet you're right. I mean, these conversations continue. Um, and um, I, I don't think I mean, I think that if you if you if you had to ask, you know, uh, sort of 10 uh, um, uh, sort of people who come to, to Upper Manhattan about the term Latinx or what term they use or how they self-identify or what they like to say when, when, when they describe themselves, you'd probably get 10 different responses. Yeah. 
and and I think that's and I think that's important, you know, and I think that's important to 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 recognize. And I think that is why, you know, Carlos, to your point, these terms are they're problematic, right? They they are problematic, um, and um, and I think it's important to talk about why they are problematic or how they are um, problematic. Um, and so I, I find that to be, you know, sort of a, an interesting um, part of, of what you've produced here because I think it does create dialogue and I think having these works you know on the terrace you know right off of Broadway um, as people are sort of walking by you know doing whatever it is that they're doing in their, in their daily life to come in and to spend some time thinking about these ideas um, and and looking um, at, at these interpretations and, and seeing these strong visual language and also the text here um, Carlos that you offer as well and kind of you know looking throughout to see also where they see themselves or, or, or where they can then find a place or space for themselves, I think um, is, is really uh, important. Um, just we had a question about, and, and you sort of brought this up a little bit, about this octopus and, and, um, and this, these sort of these uh, uh, tentacles. Uh, right. Tell us a little bit more about, about that. Uh, well, uh, it was actually uh, Joanna Fernandez who described uh, the oppression within the United States as tentacles or, or, or the, yeah, as tentacles. So it, it was really me just putting an image to it. Um, but at the same time, it was, it, was what, it was what I was already looking for without knowing what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, so she just, it, it was, it, like I said before, it wasn't really hard for me to portray that. And it, it's just the, you know, the United States being the United States. Uh, so the, the symbolism, the symbolism on that is dope. And there's so much, there's probably so much more you can extract. Um, how many, how many arms? In the, eight, right? They're supposed to be eight, but don't count them. Right. <laughs> no, right. I'm almost sure, like, if you mine effort enough, right, you can probably uh, tie it back to eight branches of, like, government or something like right. that i think i think there's a huge um Metaphor there's huge that. symbolism in, in using the, the octopus right. right well yeah i mean for, for here in this specific one it was really more about um what i had in my head was uh, the one specifically grabbing the guy in the supposed to be yellow but that's another whatever um and ripping away from its culture uh and then we have another a uh, young black brown woman, you know, on the bullhorn, which represented the, you know, the, the uprising of the time with the young lord. I, think I just noticed. I just noticed the top hat with the with the jacket. Well, the top hat's not finished. This picture was taken a day before it was. You know, some details were put in. That top hat is supposed to have stars mm -hmm. on it. Uh, it was a bit more obvious than that, but um, but yeah, like the young lords with the uh, with their jacket and the and the scarf on her left wrist with next to the bullhorn um but yeah there's uh that's i don't know if i answered the question i'm good at not answering questions yeah <laughs> that's a, no no i think it's good and in danny you brought this up and this is sort of for all of you for carla for carlos just and danny you know now that i mean this was october i mean it, it feels like you know how many months ago was that you know right it almost feels like a lifetime ago. And 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 really, you know, as you said, Carla, this is right before the election. Uh, this is before you know, the COVID vaccine. So much has transpired since mm -hmm. we on these murals. Looking back at them now and thinking about them now, thinking about your time and place today, how would you, you know, what would what would you what would you do? Would you would you change your mural? Would you add to your mural? Would you? Oh man, to be careful. Be careful, because I mean, I you can leave me there for days, and I I'll constantly change. I'm really not happy with the with the outcome of this mural. Um, very very unhappy with it. Um, I mean, the, I, I'm the symbolism and the placement of things, yes, but just the the quality of work has really suffered, and Ex I would, exec execution wise, I, yeah, yeah, I wish I had execution a, was I wish like, I could, like cross my Danny's, teeth down Danny, my eyes. Danny's size perception was all messed up, for that. <laughs> um, but it was uh, 
and I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, I can easily say, oh, you know, the constraints of COVID and the location changes could have easily been the factor, but the reality is, you know, I have uh, focus issues. <laughs> and whenever there's someone looming over me saying, you gotta get this done by Thursday, it just makes it worse. But that's my, that's a, you know, that's my, those are my own issues that I have to talk about. I, I, I want to comment on that, the district and, 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 and Danny, that considering the amount of time and the struggles you face, I think you did great. Uh, oh, because you. not only not Thank only you. that that you lost a lot of time in the um, exchanging locations and uh, changing locations, but also also the fact that uh, we were allowed to be in the facility only for eight, for eight hours a day, right. and the facility was in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And we live in Washington Heights. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, yeah, yeah. It was it was it was a t very time constrained uh, yeah. piece. Um, yeah, and, and so can I, I yeah. think we all succeed and we all did great. Thank you, Carla. I really appreciate it. And I Thank must you. say, I'm I'm so so disappointed that Grubhub canceled two of my lunch orders. Oh yeah, that, I was having a problem with that too, you know. And when <laughs> you're hungry and you're, oh my God. <laughs> you're tasting the food already and they say it's canceled by the time it's supposed to be there. Oh no, man, no, that was no. bad. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> there are some tough working conditions. There's no question. It was it was tough, you know. There's right? there's no question, you know, just that commute alone. Um yeah. <laughs> and having to be um inspired, you know, during a sort of a particular time frame is very difficult, right? I mean, it's, it's it, you know, your process, if you work late at night or if you work in the morning, you know, to, to not be able um, to do that and then to deal with also all of the COVID, you know, protocol and restrictions. Uh, and uh, the, the only thing that was uh, probably favorable in, in uh, regards to the COVID lockdown was the traffic. Um, yeah. The FDR was a breeze. That's, yeah, that's was never the case. <laughs> so I, I was I got to Brooklyn in 20, 20 minutes. That's I swam over. Unheard of. <laughs> um I, I was I was looking, I'm looking at the, the clock here. It's almost eight o'clock. This kind of flew by. Um, I wanted to ask you a question because you all, uh, you know, after we sort of did my brief introduction, you all sort of said, oh, I don't know if I if I fit into this legacy and 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 that kind of thing. Um but of course you do, right? Um, you know, you, you come out of this very rich tradition um, of, of painting on walls, um, of creating art uh, for the public, right? Um, and, and art that is accessible. And it's one of the reasons why, um, you know, the Hispanic Society was so interested also in, in taking on this exhibition. You know, this was something that we had only for two weeks at the United Palace, um, and, and it's going to be in its current location for three months, um, because we want people to be able to see these works, right? It, 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 it is part of the fabric of Upper Manhattan. Um, how, how do you, you know, reflecting on sort of history, right, of, of murals or, or public art or graffiti of wall painting, where do you, where do you see yourself um, sort of, you know, in the broader uh, um, context? If somebody wants to, to take that question on. I, I um that famous quote by Nina Simone. Uh, it's a it's an artist's duty to reflect the times. Um, I was thinking about that quote uh, while um, in anticipation for this meeting, and to further that, um, our parents didn't have the luxury of depicting the times yeah. or focusing on an art career. Right. Or, exp or expression in general. They hit the ground running when they yeah. got to this country. So it skipped a generation almost. Like there was a, there was so many things that, uh, that could have came out through, the, through that time period had we had art programs available to our parents that, you know, or, or it was viable to be an artist, right. a muralist and make a living back then. So right. I... I see it as I'm reflecting not only the, my time or my the current zeitgeist, but 
my parent my parents' uh, reflection on their time. So I'm super grateful for the opportunity to do that, and I'll I'll love to continue that for sure. Yeah. Yo, well, from I'm a, I'm a yeah I'm a say sign. I'm not a muralist. Every once in a while, I get a chance to be a muralist, but I got to hang out with this really cool muralist. That's like a real muralist, and he happens to be like chilling with us right now, and his name is Dister. Right, like, mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm a LaGuardia music and art dropout that was working at a Trump building as a concierge back in like 2009 or so. And I got fired. And I remember meeting Dister a few years before because two of our girlfriends were salsa dancers and we were talking about where we from or whatever. And then I start seeing his murals in the neighborhood. I start seeing these I love my hood murals. Right. So he's doing graffiti, but he's not like I mean, he does put his name down a lot, but he's not doing a humongous Dister. Right. He's doing little kids with fuck with water guns and playing basketball and this positive message. A lot of the times he's paying out of his own pocket. He's appropriating walls, which is a political and social act, right? He's not always waiting for permission. When he is looking for permission, he's begging, you know, uh, landlords and bodega owners for a gate, having to go through ignorant conversations about how spray paint isn't illegal and that he's a grown man and can buy it legally and being told, <laughs> oh no, eso no es arte de negros. You know, like, isn't that black yeah. art or whatever? No, I listen to all of this and I've seen him walk around the neighborhood. So he's an activist through his art, right? I mean, I know he has things to say, but just the fact that it exists the way it exists. And I'm really, really happy that he got paid to do a mural Right and guy and paid. Wait, you guys got paid? Yeah. To do other murals because he's gifted. He's gifted this neighborhood lots of free art. You know what I mean? Like lots and lots of free art that are very, very. You say woven into the fabric of this neighborhood. I'm not sure if these murals are on a grassroots level. You know what I mean? It's really nice to be shown in the Hispanic society. But if we go through the hood talking about artists in Washington Heights, little kids and people will tell you about I love my hood. You know what I mean? And they'll tell you about this around those murals. So I just want to give him a shout out. He helped me become an artist again and do murals every once in a blue. Um, so yeah, I don't know. You don't even need to talk about yourself anymore. Just oh man, thank you, Carlos. The check is in the mail. I appreciate it. <laughs> Damn, son. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I mean, uh, regarding the question that Nadia was asking, um, uh, or that someone in the chat was asking. Uh, oh yeah, you can focus on that. NYPD sucks eggplant. That one's fun. Um, it was. Um, there are so many. Here we go. In, <laughs> in, uh, in, in honestly, in five years, ten years, um, I often get people s- telling me, "Hey, you know, would you like to be in a gallery, or would you like to sell your work?" And but I'm gonna be honest, I really don't give two shits about galleries. Um, galleries are just a bunch of folks that don't look like me showing my work to people that don't look like me. Um, and I really, really, as, as cheesy and cliche as it sounds, I really enjoy painting something for my neighborhood and having people just enjoy it and take pictures of it, whether you're the, you know, the guy selling cocaine on the block or the owner of the way. So that's, that's fun for me. I really enjoy that. And to see, you know, and to go to one of the businesses and see Danny's work inside and then to see Danny's work on the other side, you know, that's super dope. That's like, that's the best for me. So in X amount of years, I would love to continue that and, you know, and have uh, have more opportunities to be able to, to show that. Because I remember when I was younger, looking at Tad's crew do what they do, it was, you know, it was like a, a world away to be able to finish that. Right. Like, how, would I, how would I get to do that? Like who? Who's gonna? It just it seems so distant, right? Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. So it, you know, so I do give props to to like people like Danny who are just take like you know it takes a lot of balls for you to just be like yeah I'm just gonna do this anyway you know I might not be able to pay the rent but yeah I'll do it. It looks like we need a, a walking tour of uh, 
Northern Manhattan uh, for our next uh, event. Um, Carla, how about you? Well, I um, I just started my uh, my career as a muralist in uh, 2018. I did a some murals before, but uh, in 2018, I, win, I won a big public art commission that it was granted by the DOT uh, public art program. And uh, since then, um, that was a game changer for me because then I start um, transitioning more from uh, my background is in graphic design and illustration. And I worked for the graphic industry many, many years while keeping a, a, a studio work uh, aside and uh, um, doing exhibitions here and there. Um, but uh, in 2018, after I won this commission, uh, then that opened up doors to other commissions, um, big commissions. And also I learned, and, and this, is, this is something also for, for, for you, Dister, um, that, and that and Danny also I learned like how to apply to grants to the city and uh, and uh, there's a grant specifically for for public art uh, granted by the UMX uh, for northern uh, northern Manhattan artists specifically. So I learned how to apply to these grants and I have been applying and I I have been granted um two consecutive three consecutive consecutive years. Um, a grant to create murals. So I'm very excited because I am, I am also in the mission of beautifying my neighborhood. So I apply for the grants to create murals in the neighborhood uh, with the community. And um, as, as, as opposed as your process, I do not go on appropriate spaces. Uh, I go with permission. And, and what, I, what I do is I always consider where my work is gonna be and uh, who is gonna watch it, who are the neighbors, where is located, where, what could I bring to them that is of a positive impact. And also sometimes I, I do uh, invite the community to create it with me and that's a beautiful, amazing process that I like the best because then the story changes. And the story does not go anymore. An artist came and did a mural, which is a good story, but this one is better. An artist came and together we did a mural. So when you include them in the conversation, you ask them, what is, what is good for you, for your world, in your space, for your institution, for your neighborhood, for, for your childcare center, for your bodega, et cetera, et cetera. And you engage them in the creative and the ideation of the process, and then give give them also the opportunity to to help you in 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 the in the in the painting, and that creates a sense of belonging and a sense of um, appropriation of the of the work that um, is different. And so I like I I enjoy doing um, that a lot, and I'm happy that I'm gonna start um, probably next week a big floor mural that was granted by these grants at the Polo Grounds, uh, which is a nice a nice housing project in, in very close to my house. Um, so I'm very happy about that, and um, through other grants I am also going going to put up another mural in 173 and another mural in the Lower East Side. So Wait, 173 and what? One ter, a better 173 or 172, 172 and San Nicolas. Uh, oh. By the Atubon project that I, I, you, I, uh, you are also part oh, of. The bird, I know the because I was, I was given the list. <laughs> yeah, the bird is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, this there is, is there also, cool, cool. So, um, so yeah, so um, in terms of how I see myself and, and in the future, I would love to continue doing muralism because I find it's a very powerful practice um, that um, expands my art, uh, my art practice. And I, uh, I am not only an artist, but also a facilitator and the artwork uh, transcends the image to become the experience, to become the collective experience. And then you build the relationships, you create dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. And that enriched me very much as an artist and as a person. And um, 
And so I would love to continue doing that. Moreover, I will also like to, um, to expand my practice to create a tiled ceramic mural and I'm on it. So <laughs> I'm go, very go much excited it. about it. it. Oh yeah, I'm definitely. All, I'm all about I, am so, uh, I am so about exploring that. So yeah, exploring so different mediums, man. That's what I'm <laughs> yeah. about right now. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the wonders of being an artist, isn't it? That our job never, never will end. We will never retire and we will learn, learn uh, and learn and learn every day. It's amazing. <laughs> well, you, you are, you are the eyes and ears of, of you know, the human experience. I mean, that, that's, that's what you do. You're the, you're the documentarians um, of, of our time. Um, and uh, I thank you all for, for your time. This was really um, exciting and interesting. And I know you all um, have a lot of your own projects um, that you're working on. And I also know that you're going to be participating um, in workshops um, at the Hispanic Society over the summer for, um, on mural making. And I think those are in July. I think they're the 10th, the 17th. Uh, the 24th and the 31st. So I encourage you all um, to visit the Hispanic Society's website for more information about how to um, connect uh, with these fabulous uh, artists uh, who joined us this evening. Um, please, I invite you all to come to the Audubon Terrace um, to spend some time with these murals, um, to, to spend some time. There's also a, an adjunct exhibition on um, photographs um, from in the Heights as well, uh, including photographs uh, at Boricua College from um, Noma's uh, rich archives uh, of, of stroll um, events as well. So we'd like to invite you uh, to uh, the Hispanic Society to these workshops. Um, please visit the Hispanic Society uh, website, visit Noma website for um, some interesting uh, programs that we have as well. Um, and uh, once again, thank you for being here. Thank you uh, to the Hispanic Society um, for inviting me to participate. Um, it's really been a, a pleasure um, and an honor to be with you all uh, tonight. Thank you everyone and have a great evening. Thank you again. Thank you.